We're recording. Anything that you say may be taken down and used as evidence against you. <laughs> That's what they say when they arrest people. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like we're in court, right? Exactly. The camera has been turned. Because today we're talking about audiences. And I think we must begin because the time is, well, yeah, a couple of minutes late already. Mm. Yes, so let's begin. I'll just write this and then we'll do the mind of three later. to remember the key words for today's lecture. So you can see media, effects, active audience. Okay, all will be explained. Right, let's begin our mindful breathing.
it's brilliant. The voice is so calm, isn't it? It's amazing. Right. Um, why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> um, media effects, audiences. So the reason why, just to reiterate for anybody in the right lane or didn't understand what I said the first time. So the reason why today I'm not filming myself uh, making you my audience is that I want to look at that boundary between media producers and media receivers. Audience, it, the audience is a bunch of media receivers. And it relates to everything that we've talked about so far. <coughs> so, those of you, I would assume that nobody knows the difference between media effects and active audience theory. Am I right? Or does anybody think he or she knows something about what media effects is? Okay. What does effect mean? Something has an impact on something. Yes, yeah, so it's very much like that subject-object model that, that way back in two, I think we talked about it. The idea that the media producer has so much power that the audience, you and I, the viewers, are relatively powerless, okay? So the assumption, now when did media effects theory began? After the Second World War, right up until the 1960s and 70s, and that's when it changed. But I just wanna focus on that historical time period at the moment. Um, and the assumptions of these media effects theorists were that the media, the mass media, any media that we have discussed so far, has the same effect on everybody, nationally, individually, culturally, at the same time. There is, so it focuses on commonalities, what's similar, amongst audiences, yeah? A bit like, the me I'm gonna give you two examples today. You're, you're gonna be my experiment, I'm gonna play you um, texts and you're gonna to respond to them as audiences. And I've, I, I, I very deliberately have um, uh, prepared some texts that I think neither of you, have, neither of you, none of you has seen before. And so it's gonna test whether the clips have the same effect on you or whether you have different responses to the text. So once again, media effects is the idea that the media is so powerful and we the audiences are so powerless that we have no control over, and here's the word, ideology. Remember that word? Political economists talk about ideology. Uh, they talk about the concentration of power in media ownership and production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the model, it's a, it, and, it, and it actually agrees with the propaganda model, obviously, that, that the media are more powerful than you and I. When, historically, did we start to question this model from the perspective of, of media scholarship? Well, the answer is simple. In the 70s onwards, that was when there was huge counterculture movements, questioning of power in the Western world from a feminist perspective, from a race perspective. And also, we're also talking about that post-Cold War period from the 1990s onwards, when the internet arrived. And the big myth, as you know, and I am using that word myth deliberately, the big myth is that the internet has leveled power so that audiences are powerful. I'm questioning that one, aren't I? But that's what we're told. Can start with a clip. So our case study, as as we've had quite a lot on this course so far, is uh, Gaza and Palestine. So I'm going to show you a BBC clip of a recent report of um, the the conflict. Or I'm going to say I'm going to call it what it is: the genocide in um, Gaza. But it's it's a BBC text. Now you remember the BBC is a public service broadcaster, or dare I say it? a pluralist service broadcaster. So link with that idea of pluralism. Towards the end of today's lecture, I'm gonna to play you a very different um, account
account of what's happening in Gaza and Palestine by Yanis Varoufakis, a much more critical account of the role. He, he, he makes a very strong statement about basically how the whole of the global media today, mainstream commercial media, is complicit in the genocide because it's not reporting it the way it should. And so what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a clip. <clears throat> I'll start in a moment with the BBC clip. And I'm just going to say to you, what do you guys think? Do you, is it, do you agree with it? And therefore, is it having the same effect on you all at the same time? Do you reject it? Do you oppose it? Do you say it's rubbish? Do you say it's ideology? Or do you say, well, I kind of agree with that part of it, but that part is rubbish, yeah? So, yeah, and, and then I'll, we'll talk more about media effects and active audience. So here's the clip, first of all. Um, and as I said, in terms of the camera, I actually deliberately, in my mind, I planned this because I want to see you watching the clip. I want to see that. It's a, it's a live, embodied experience, yeah? Don't worry, it's nothing shocking. I mean, Gaza is shocking, obviously, but it's, but it's not, you know, not, not going to do anything horrible. Um, Representatives of Hamas, the US and Qatar are in Egypt as part of attempts to agree a six-week ceasefire in Gaza. But Israel is pushing for a list of hostages still alive in Gaza before it will send a delegation to the talks. Hamas says Israel must withdraw its forces before there can be a deal on hostages. Pressure for a truce has intensified since Thursday when at least 112 people were killed as crowds rushed towards an aid convoy in the north of the territory amid Israeli army gunfire. Overnight, another Israeli strike on Rafa in the south killed 20 people, including twin babies, according to health officials and Gaza's civil defence. Our senior international correspondent, Orla Gearin, reports from Tel Aviv. You may find some of the images in her report upsetting. A truce can't come soon enough. In Rafah, another day of harrowing loss. Palestinians mourn for 20 members of the Abu Ansa family. Killed in their beds by an Israeli airstrike, according to hospital officials and Gaza's civil defense. Among the dead, five month old twins, as old as the war, Naim and Wissam laid down gently with their relatives. <coughs> their mother, Rania, spent 10 years trying to have them and endured three rounds of IVF. Now all she can cradle is their baby clothes. I gave birth during the war, she says. It started on Saturday. I gave birth the next Friday. I didn't get enough of them. I swear, I didn't get enough. I have no one else, she says. They've gone with their father. We were sleeping, I swear. Israel continues to say it takes feasible precautions to lessen civilian harm. There were about 35 people in the house, says Farouk Abu Anza. Most of them children. There were no fighters. The house collapsed on them, three or four stories. In Israel, too, families in anguish. Their loved ones trapped in tunnels in Gaza. They need to be released now. This weekend, they've been pleading with their government to do a deal to bring the hostages back home. So offer is a very uh, warm uh, person. Uh, you can see his smile. He's a family person. He has four uh, children, lovely children. How hard is this time for the families? This this wait must seem endless. It's like a hell, you know. We are uh, 
in some of a, a loop uh, since the October 7. Uh, we are living this day uh, every day again and again. We have uh, only one goal uh, all these days to bring him back alive to his family, to his children. Uh, this is the only thing that matters. But there will be no homecoming for offer or any of the hostages without a ceasefire. And no respite for mothers like Rania burying their children in Gaza. I think it will be several days before we know if there will be a deal or not. Israel is in. Okay. <coughs> so obviously. <coughs> don't really even need to say it. That's very disturbing material, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's um, I don't know about you, but when I watch that, I just feel a, a tremendous sense of what's happening in the world to allow this to happen, but also what can I do? What can we do to make this, to help these Palestinian people and, um, and so on? But for the, for the purposes of, of today's lecture and an academic context, what did you think about the, that BBC News report? So obviously I might say to you, for example, did you think it was truthful? Do you think it was, next week we're gonna talk about representation of race and gender. Do you think it was a fair representation of uh, the Israelis in the conflict as well as a fair representation of the Palestinians? What, what are your thoughts? Is there anything that, that you thought, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I don't wanna tell you what to think. I wanna, I wanna hear what you think. Anything that struck you as being, yeah, did you, did you, from a media effects perspective, you know, did you feel it's telling me what to think? Because that's what media effects is saying. It's like the producer, the BBC has more power than you. Did it, does it tell you what to think? So, so do you feel, that, I think most of you will probably agree, it's very emotional. Yes. Yeah. Do you think the emotional makes it manipulative? If, you, if it was just without the emotion, would that make it better? BBC is in favor of Palestine. BBC is in favor of Palestine. Is that what you said? Yeah. Is that what you thought that, that yeah. it says? Yeah. What makes you think that? You thought it was biased towards Palestine. Yeah, it's because it prefers some uh, enemies of Palestine uh, who was attacked by Israel. Uh, is there anything that the, the BBC report said that made you think this is biased towards Palestine? No, Putin's okay. Pardon? Putin's okay. Then. So are you saying then you think maybe you're seeing more Palestinian distress, there are more victims than the Israelis? Maybe, I'm, you know, I'm not, from, from an active audience perspective, you can't be wrong, <laughs> because what you think is what matters. You're gonna say something, yeah? Yeah, so actually there's no, So, do you have to think the opposite of Jen? Do you think it was biased towards Israel? Yeah. Wow, you see, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. um, and that's perfect example 
of active audience. Yeah. Because you're not agreeing. That doesn't suit the media effects argument. It affects everybody at the same time. And what the BBC journalists that I've interviewed say, and they say it all over the place, not just to me, is that they say the BBC gets complaints from people saying, you're biased towards Israel, you're biased towards Palestine. And they think, well, that's good, because we must be balanced. Yeah. But, and there is a but, and I want you to hear what you think about this. Did you not get the sense that it was like, here's the Palestinian side, here's the Israeli side. Did you hear any historical context about just, just none at all? Emotion over history. Yeah. Objective, ideological, media effects. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. I have one comment. I'm not sure how I'm going to phrase it in, in, in a way that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, when sure. 